Welcome back to Diabet Tech. I'm Justin. I have type 1 diabetes and I had a very special Q&A with Lauren Bongiorno. She's a fellow type 1 diabetic. She also has a podcast called Reclaim Your Rise, and she's also the founder of Risely Health, which is a virtual type 1 diabetes health coaching resource. Uh, her and I were on each other's podcast recently. I'll have those links down in the description. Uh, I talked all about my diabetes diagnosis and technology on hers. She came on mine to talk about diabetes management and a bunch of other interesting stuff like hormones and kind of just like the mental health aspects of diabetes. So you'll want to check those out. Um, so we had a Q&A on Instagram, a live Q&A, uh, but I recorded it. That way I could put it up on YouTube. It is uh, really fascinating. We had you ask all of your questions and um, there was some interesting stuff in there. So I had to put it up on YouTube. Keep in mind though, Lauren and I are not doctors and nothing we say should be considered medical advice. Nothing I do on social media or YouTube or my podcast should be considered medical advice. Always consult with your doctors before making changes to your healthcare. But I hope you enjoy this Q&A. Let me know if you want to see more stuff like this. I would love to host more Q&As on Instagram or even TikTok. So yeah comment below if you want to see more. All right, let's get into it. So welcome everyone. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, this is Lauren Bocciorno. I was on her podcast and she was on my podcast, uh, Reclaim Your Rise, it's her podcast or up here. Um, and then uh, mine's called Diabetex. So if you haven't watched those, you should. Uh, we had some fascinating conversations on both of them. Today, we just wanted to have a live to kind of, for those people who did listen to our podcast episodes, to kind of bring those questions in that they may have had. Uh, and if other que if you have other questions, we'll be answering them. Uh, but first, we're going to kind of just have like a back and forth between the two of us on diabetes technology and kind of how it's helped us out. Lauren, you've been living with type 1 significantly longer than I have. I'm, I'm two years in. How long have you had diabetes? On November 1st. It'll be 23 years, so I have a few, but just, just you, a few. Have, have a you lot really, more, yeah, I was going to say you have a lot more, you compacted your diabetes technology knowledge into a very short amount of time. I feel like it took me 23 years to get a full scope, but also the landscape was changing, but like in what best technology out there is and just how to optimize it, which I'm excited to talk about with you today too. Yeah, for sure. I feel like at the time when I was diagnosed just two years ago at 30, I was already like a tech YouTuber. So it kind of just came naturally for like, and I was also diagnosed like on TikTok posting video content. So it kind of just kind of came natural for me to be like, okay, I'll, I'll create some content on this. And then it just kept growing and growing. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with this conversation. Feel free to throw questions out that are relevant to what we're saying. Otherwise, Hold your questions for the end of this live and we'll be taking like all of your questions. So um, first, Lauren, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Yes. Yeah, so and also I see everybody in the chat putting how long you've had type one. So I can see there's some parents on here as well, which I love. Um, and if you go ahead and drop if you haven't yet how long you've had type one or your child has had type one so we can get to know you guys too. But um, very quick introduction, funny story background for you when I was. <laughs> <laughs> when I did for Justin's podcast interview with him, um, I at the end of every podcast I've interviewed him, you know, when somebody I'll always kind of say, you know, how, how did that feel for you? Just because I want to make sure that they got everything they wanted for the episode. And Justin, you were the most honest person. You <laughs> like fantastic episode. The intro was a little bit long. You could have like made that a little bit more concise. And I was like, love the constructive feedback. Thank you. Um, so this introduction is <laughs> very. Sorry. It's so funny. Wait, first, it's so funny that you say that because after we hung up, I was like, was I too harsh? But I was like, I was just being super real and you asked the question. So I was like, it was a phenomenal conversation. The intro was a little long and I cut out like as much as I could. That made sense to cut out if you didn't. <laughs> Listen, listen, I practiced that elevator pitch so many times, but sometimes I'm like, there's just so much to get in. But anyways, I love your directness. Um, Anyways, so for you guys who don't know, hi, my name is Lauren Bongiorno. I was diagnosed when I was seven years old with type diabetes. It'll be 23 years coming up in November. Um, I, you know, part of my journey, I am the founder today of Risely Health. We are a type 1 diabetes health coaching company. All of our coaches on our team live with type 1 diabetes. We're naturally 
certified. We focus on behavior change, change focus on really helping you take ownership outside your endocrinologist office with mindset and with numbers and in just how you feel on your and your every day. Um, but how I got there was because growing up, I had you know great access to healthcare. Um, the technology wasn't you know so great as it is right now. I'm on Omnipod Five. I absolutely love it. Um, but all to say, I had great access to healthcare, and I got to the point where in college I had a 5.7, and I thought on paper I was doing everything right, and I was being celebrated. However, I felt the most unhealthy I'd ever been with my diabetes because I felt like it was controlling so much of my life. It was controlling my brain space. It was controlling every decision I was making. I didn't know how to just live life with diabetes where I could have the best of both worlds. I can feel good numbers wise, but I could also feel like I can just, you know, live with more freedom and more confidence. Um, and so my journey to ultimately getting to where I am today was I figured out I just, you know, people with type 1 diabetes, we need more accountability, we need more handholding, we need more education and how to not just take the tools of technology and, and um, you know, the foundational things we've learned, but really how to make it work for our specific bodies. And the only way we can can get to do that is by slowing down prioritizing ourselves so you know that's what our team and i and myself we do today we've helped over 650 at this point um people with type of diabetes as well as parents um and i'm very passionate about the work we do because we get people those results um they're not able to on their own and we're able to help them um just become better versions of themselves when diabetes is in a way yeah and a little intro for me um i like i'm a, like a totally different kind of angle of you know, helping people, I guess, uh, control or manage their diabetes. But mostly, I like to tell people what's out there and available when it comes to technology. So whenever there's new announcements on tech, I'm creating content, whether it's on my YouTube channel or my podcast, where I interview, uh, you know, CEOs and tech leaders and people from all the different companies to learn about their technology and where it's going. Um, and then on TikTok and Instagram, making, you know, fun, entertaining content, whether I'm dressed up as a Long Island mother or uh, just showing up. Hilarious, because I'm from Long Island. So like, those are all my friends' moms. <laughs> right, you get it. Yeah, literally, that's what I grew up with. So, uh, and then I was, di like I said earlier, I was diagnosed on TikTok just post posting videos. I was originally misdiagnosed as type two, which happens all too often. So I'm trying to spread the word about that too and get people diagnosed um, at the right, you know, as, as quickly as possible. So today we're focusing on diabetes technology. Lauren, I want to start with you because I saw a question roll in. You mentioned this Omnipod 5. How long have you been on it? And tell me about it. What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? That's a great, great question. I'm curious to hear, you know, your thoughts on what you've heard in the community. But um, what I, I, I will say, I was on Medtronic Pump. I was on MDI for my first two years, ages seven through nine, then went to Medtronic Pump from ages seven to 18, and then went to Omnipod out of seven to maybe like 20, actually. I lose track. But then I went on Omnipod Dash. I've been on the Dash of the Omnipod system for a few years. The tubeless is a game changer for me. I can't imagine going back to a wired pump. Um, but I will say every time I switch, so from Med MD, not so much MDI to Medtronic, but from Medtronic to Omnipod and um, Omnipod to Omnipod 5, which I switched to last um, Thanksgiving, so November-ish, around there, there was so much like hesitation on my part. So it's just about like, not feeling confident with knowing what you're getting yourself into. So you can have something that everybody tells you, this is so much better. It has this feature and this feature and this feature. But if you're not like a, techno a technologically, technologically savvy person like you are, like me, like I like struggle with turning a remote on sometimes. I'm like, ah, it's not working. Like screw it, i a book tonight, like kind of thing. I felt such resistance because I'm like, I just don't want to take the time to learn it. When I had the box, I had the box for about three months I got it from Omnipod and I was going on I was getting married in September and I was going on my honeymoon and I was like I don't want to start a new system beforehand but as soon as I got on it it took so it was like an hour tops to like figure it out it, it was so easy to follow and then I got on and I was like why did I resist this for three months like I'm so so happy that I went on it so I'm sure you have a different experience and you're like I want to try all the diabetes technology but I think that it's you know, want to honor everybody's scope of, or just like their experience, because I think like I probably represent a large majority of people in the diabetes space as well. Yeah, I think you made a few great points about just in general switching 
your treatment and your technology that you use, that's really scary for a lot of people because A, it forces you to confront this disease you're living with and have to like focus on it and think about it. It becomes like at the forefront of, you know, your mind for a bit. It has to because you're switching, you know, devices. And then also it's just like technology can be scary for people or like people just don't work well with technology. And that's why I do what I do because I want to make technology easier. If it's going to be tied to your health, um, I want to make it as easy as possible. And yeah, I, I love uh, technology in general. I love explaining it. And that's also part of the reason why I'm on a different system. I use Omnipod Dash <laughs> and I use the Dexcom G7 CGM. And the, currently, Omnipod 5 and all the other pump systems don't work with the G7 in a closed loop system. And th for those of you who don't know what closed loop is, that's when your pump talks to your CGM and regulates insulin delivery based off of your blood sugars. Anyway, I'm using Omnipod Dash pods and the G7 together in unison in a closed loop system using the DIY system loop, which I've got on my phone. Yes, it's all controlled on my phone and my Apple Watch. Um, and I can bolus from here. I can even put in the glycemic index because it's not it's not cleared by the FDA. Mm. Because of that, app updates come out whenever they want them to. Like this is a group of really smart people that created this app. I didn't create this. I had to build it myself though. Um, there were files. I took it. If anyone wants to learn about Loop, you can go to loopdocs.org uh, to learn more. Uh, but yeah, I really love the system. I agree tubeless is just like incredible. I forget that my Omnipod's on me. Mm -hmm. I find that there are so many areas on my body that I can easily put it there and it like doesn't get in the way at all. So I love how small it is. Um, and I love that it works with the G7. The G7's been great. So question for you, the G7, I'm hearing a lot about the G7 not being accurate and a lot of our coaching. So we have group coaching programs and they all, you know, talk in between our sessions and it's big community. And so they're all right now, I was just on the thread today and they're all like, we were rushing to get to the G6. And now we're like, oh wait, I find that Omnipod's not hooked up with it yet because Omnipod 5 isn't because I'm hearing, like everyone's hearing that it's not as great. So what's your opinion on okay. it? So when it comes to accuracy, I think it does a fantastic okay. job. This is what I think. And then, but when it comes to connection, I don't think it does a great job. So let's start with accuracy. So the G7 accuracy for me, I've been wearing it nearly six. I've been wearing it six months. I have a six month review coming up on my YouTube channel. Okay. So stay tuned for that. Um, accuracy is, it's great. Like the, the, the graph can sometimes be a little spotty, like be a little boop, 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 more so than the G6. So from what I've heard, that's because the G6 had what was called like a smoothing technology that even if it was getting readings that were a little spotty, it was still smoothing it out and almost like averaging it out. Hmm. What if the G7 doesn't, doesn't have it? I don't know why, but it, that that is a fact. Now, I also was testing a Libre 3 this past two weeks, Ooh. side by side, and the two of them were very on par. Interesting. Uh, third of all, I don't have any, I don't have any fake lows. Uh, I haven't really had... Uh, lows or highs with my Dexcom G7 or I haven't noticed them. Maybe that happened a couple times, but that's not bad. But in general, two things. CGMs are running 20 minutes behind. So if you're going to test your blood sugar and look at the reading, there's no, it's very rare that they would be the same, right? Because it's running 20 Yeah, I'm going to challenge you on that. I don't think it was 20 minutes. Are you 100% sure? I, I Every time I hear it's 15, 15 20 okay. minutes because it's testing your interstitial I fluid. I would, have, I would have said, I think I I have looked and seen more like 10 minutes because 15, 20 minutes, I feel like that is a huge difference. From what I've heard is 15, 20 minutes. That's something if someone at home wants to look that up and then comment. You know, um, I, but that's a but also, ultimately, even if they aren't the same, you know, we're really wearing CGMs for trends. We want to see high, fast rises, fast drops because that's what we'll get our warnings earlier, essentially. Anyway. Accuracy wise, I found it to be pretty good. Connection wise is where I find a lot of issues mm. or just a, 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 a huge issue is the fact that my phone needs to be near me all the time. Mm. Like I, I can't be more than 
10 feet away from my phone. And even sometimes when my phone's in my pocket, in the pocket on the other side of my body from my Dexcom, it will disconnect. I do remember. Or- podcast. And I think that it's possible that that could be a holdup for, um, for pulse. Yeah. Okay. And well, also talking about the watch and how that's the next phase of having the Bluetooth go from your Apple iWatch to directly to your um, CGM or your CGM directly to your watch and taking out the phone. So who knows, like maybe that will be the improvement that they see. And maybe they're even teeing it up for that. It's like, oh, this connection sucks there. But like, look, it's going to be so great once it's, you know, once we set it up to get to, you you know, directly to the uh, to the to the watch. Yeah, I was thinking that too, although there's no way everyone's going to want to get an Apple Watch. Um, Because honestly, even I did a video recently on Instagram, TikTok, um, not wearing an Apple Watch for a week. And there were a lot of things I loved about it. I think my Apple Watch, um, it's almost sometimes too accessible to my numbers. And I, I don't, and taking it off for a week, I was like, wow. I was really way more in the moment and not thinking about my diabetes, not to mention like texts and all these and calls coming to my watch, leaving my phone over there. But then at the flip side, I was like looking at my phone to see my numbers and then going on Instagram. And I was like, no, I don't want to get sucked in. Just it's technology at the end of the day. But to your point, so also um, I want to scroll back because somebody said I just Googled it. Um, G7 updates every five minutes. Apparently, yeah, that's not the answer to what we were saying. The injury, yeah, exactly. Not just the updates, but actual like how far it is behind your the actual reading of your blood sugar compared to what it's reading on your phone. But to that point, Justin, like you're such a big tech guy, and I think why we mesh so well and how we and how we first of all we talk about is because you bring this tech now these technology advance all the power of how great this is, and what I bring is hey it's still really important to listen to your body and to know your body's patterns. Because one thing that so many people struggle with, and we didn't talk about this on the podcast, but one thing that we struggled with, uh, a lot of people struggle with that come into coaching is over treating their lows, right? It's just this pattern of, if you look at a lot of highs that people have on their graphs and speaking like what you said about trends, you can almost always, you know, look before it and there was a low blood sugar and that over treat or I'm going into a meal low, so I'm going to delay my insulin. And it's tricky, right? But all to say, if you're low and you have a, a, a 60 straight arrow down, you're treating, 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 treating. If you are really, really, really mindful and you can separate yourself from your CGM in that moment, you will realize 10 out of 10 times that your body actually starts to feel like it's coming up and back into what I call like that safety place way before that arrow is turning around. Right. And so what's happening is you're seeing the number in the arrow freaking out. You're like, more juice, more juice, more juice, when really your body's actually starting to go up. And it's finally five minutes later or 10 minutes later or 15 minutes later, whatever it is, catches up. And now you're double arrow up, you know, going straight up. And you're like, oh my God, I'm riding the roller coaster. So really that like intuition and getting to know your body's patterns and using technology as a guide, but not fully like the be all end all, I think is really important. Yeah. A couple things. First, I want to answer this thing that someone said, then make sure I talk about Coachella, and then I want to ask you a question. <laughs> so first of all, um, someone, uh, Kenna C. Porter said that um, they're the worst at over-treating lows. I don't know how to prevent it. Let me tell you what I do, what works well for me. First of all, I make sure to treat the low. So I I grab some orange juice, I get some, some maybe even some nuts to just add some protein after um, cause I don't want to like go too, too crazy high. I guess I find that the protein like kind of extends the sugar a bit. Uh, but I get that, I get that sugar in. What I do is I plug in all the carbs I'm taking. It's not going to dose. It's not going to dose for those, it, those carbs. But as I'm going, rah, 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 I'm keeping track of all the carbs I'm actually eating. I know a lot of people don't do this. A lot of people don't track their low treatments, but why not? Why not tell the pump I'm having 30 grams of sugar of orange juice right now? Because if it doesn't know that, how's it going to account for that rise that's 100% happening yep. and maybe even going to ride you too much? Yep. So that's what I do. And I found that I almost rarely, like 1% go um, high after I treat lows. 
I, I always like kind of, you know, I'll go up, but, and then it will kind of level off. Yeah. So I find that letting my device know this is how much I use to treat my low. Um, it supports me better. It's not going to dose insulin for you because it knows where your blood sugar is, you know? So that's what I find. Do you, do you log your low snacks? In my pump specifically, like in Omnipod 5? Yeah. Um, I mostly do it when I over-treat the lows. So if I know that I over-treated the lows, like one time I remember distinctly, I made a video about this. I was in a Trader Joe's parking lot. Everybody says like all the memes on like Pinterest or whatever, social media are like, don't go shopping when you're hungry. Yeah, no, like don't go shopping when you're hungry. Or like, please, like that's dangerous. So anyways, I was coming out of the grocery store. I'm sitting in the grocery store. I was like, I was low and I had a fresh bag fried mangoes and I was that I just bought and I love it's like my kryptonite I don't buy it all the time because it's dangerous and I just ate you know I, I knew it it was happening and I'm like oh it's happening and I as soon as I did that I bullets for those carbs so not I I took it a step further not only did I log it but I mostly if I over carbs I know I need to eat that I will bullets for it because I know that that mango is gonna hit me a lot faster than the food is going to um than the than the insulin is going to be to be and so it kind of just hits at a nice right time to prevent that high but that is i've no i i am very strategic in how i do that this is not a psa to go you know give it your low it has to be done in a way that like you really know your body's patterns and that you're not going to just like tank from giving more insulin yeah again we're also not doctors so like everything we're kind of talking about is really just from our personal experience right so just keep that in mind um, I wanted to bring up Coachella real quick because it go it connects with what you were saying about over treating lows. One okay. thing with what I had at Coachella also was wearing my Apple Watch, and I was because I was letting letting myself kind of roam around and really put myself just like in a different state, really, and trying to like enjoy myself. There was still part of me over controlling my diabetes on my watch and like getting afraid of highs and lows. Uh, before they happened and so day one i over treated a lot of things I, I had a terrible mental health uh day and um also just like didn't take care of my blood sugar as well and day number two i took off my apple watch and i decided i'm going to do i'm going to just listen for the alarms treat like wait for the alarm i don't think there really is any reason to know your blood sugar level, unless it's high or low, or gonna be high or low, um, we get, we're it's so accessible these days, right? Um, but I'm trying my best, being like the the person who has my blood sugar behind me with my sugar pixel, <laughs> which if you want to check it out, there's a link in my bio. Um, I'm also finding that balance of like yeah. technology is helpful and useful. We should use it, but when should it be? Used? Right. How often? Should and it be? that question. And scales, right? It goes beyond diabetes. That's the age all. Okay, so you're so wonderful, but at what point for mental health? So um, I do think that, you know, to your point, you have to know what your limit is and what your threshold is. Fine that my numbers, I can't tell, but they're every time I take a Dexcom break and I test my blood sugar, I am in range. When I tell you, I think I'm 100% in time and range for like the two days that I take a break in between because I'm not overreacting to those numbers or thinking that I'm smarter than the insulin, right? So it's just, just kind of like patience and letting things right out. And that mental health aspect that you spoke about is so important because look, I'll tell you this, Justin, we have as many people that come us and come through our coaching programs at Risely that that are higher time and ranges that are, you know, 50, 60% looking to increase. We have at least 25% of people that come to us with six A1Cs and 90% time and range. And why are they coming to us? They're coming to us because being in control of the numbers is not enough to feel healthy as a person. The mental health aspect and not getting it on that roller coaster or that, that train of perfectionism, there's no data that shows that achieving 100% time and range equates to a longer life, 75% time and range consistently, right? We have to really like look and be like, what are we chasing here? And why are we chasing that perfectionism? So that's kind of one yeah, of my- Absolutely. Uh, also everyone, we're going to start taking questions. So feel free to start having those roll in. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I truly like, I'm used to like with my I see my numbers often are in like the 86% range mm. but when I have like a day that's like 
69, like I get really hard. I beat myself up yeah. and I shouldn't because like you said, like doctors, everyone says you want to be 70% and above and you won't have long lasting effects. Uh, but I get like a little spoiled by some of the good results I get um, that the, those bad days do really get on me. But um, Rory type one traveler said something really, really sweet. And she said, or they said, uh, you can't let the diabetes rule your life. You have it. It doesn't have you. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it just goes with the, like a lot of what we're saying, which is like, you really don't let it control your life. <laughs> like be mindful, treat, treat, treat it when it needs to be treated, but don't like let it get in the way, I guess, when it doesn't have to. Yeah. yeah. There's also a really uh, comment here from, uh, I don't know, I can't what your what your handle is i'm sorry but it says that's strange i would have thought someone who was used to the old technology would be constantly checking their sugar on the new technology and someone who's newly diagnosed with all the new tech would rely on alarms huh yeah i i actually find it to be the opposite i find that people who are diagnosed in the era of getting on a dexcom right away i disagree i don't want to I I think I kind of disagree a little bit. Or you have such a heavy reliance on the alarms and the attachment to like checking, 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 and all of this data where there's nothing to compare it to. Like when you don't have diabetes, your numbers still go up up after a meal. Your numbers still maybe stay up there for a little bit before they come back down. Yes, they're not going up to 300 or 200 if you're not having insulin resistance or type two, but like. They're not a straight line. And so you set this expectation of yourself that you're supposed to have this straight line all the time and any deviation is bad. And, you know, for us, when we were diagnosed younger with just a blood sugar meter, right, like we checked literally five times a day. And then if you felt low or high, so you checked when you woke up two hours after eating and before bed, and then if you felt low or high in between and that right there showed, okay, that's the metric for when you treat and when you look. And it taught you how to listen to your body for when we need to check in between. So that's why I think as much as I think the Dexcom can be a stressor for for me and like anybody else with like the alarms and the triggers of like you feel your stress response going up with that alarm or that vibration goes off. I also, I think, have a better relationship to my numbers than what I see in a lot of newly diagnosed people and kind of what I try. Just. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have another question from from Iramenda. How do you know how many carbs to take based on how low you are? I always overtreat 100% of the time. Oh, but- here's what I do. Let, I'll, I'll give a couple things. First of all, I am a creature of habit with my low snacks. I have the same or I have the same brand orange juice in my refrigerator, and I also have the same cups I use every time. Mm-hmm. And I measured how many ounces this cup holds. Yep. So based off of that math, I know that that cup always fills when i fill it full 15 grams of carbs so if i need 30 i take 30 and and i kind of base how much i need based off of like how low i am if i'm 65 and like sideways arrow i'm prob- i'm not dropping as crazy as i could you know i'll have one glass of those maybe have um a piece of chocolate or something anyway i think being a creature of habit and knowing the serving sizes and getting those carb counts down is really helpful. Uh, there are apps out there that can help you learn a carb count. Cause I think at the basis of all of it, you really have to have your carb counting down, especially to get your other settings like insulin, uh, sen- sens- uh, insulin to carb ratio. Cause if you don't have your carbs down, it's going to mess up all your settings. I think. Yes. And I can talk about this, Justin, for probably 20 minutes actually is so nuanced. I think the most important thing to share is that when you, before automated, which is interesting to you, before automated insulin delivery pumps, you would need to treat your body differently because the pump wouldn't suspend itself. Now what's happening, so for those of us, including, you know, obviously myself who were diagnosed years ago without automated insulin pumps, I knew that like if I was 60, I would need 15 carbs to bring me back up to let's say 110 range without rebounding and with coming up enough if I didn't have any insulin on board. With the automated insulin pump now, it's trending. It's watching me trend down. It's pulling back the background insulin, which is a suspension. So essentially it's giving you this like double version of a like treatment. And so I, for a blood sugar of 60, need like 
eight carbs. So it's different and you have to kind of relearn. And that's why I talk about like optimizing the systems you're on because it's not just about like, okay, let's just switch a new system and just do everything it says or let it do its thing. You have to know how to kind of change your body, you know, along the way. So um, good point. Yeah. Automated systems, if you're not on one there, you should highly consider it because they really are safety cushions because not only is your blood sugar going up or down, but these systems are actively working to curve those and make them easier on you and your body. Mm -hmm. And of course, you'll still need to kind of do your thing, but it's just not as intense as it once was. Yeah. Lauren, I have a question. I think this is really good for you to answer, mm -hmm. especially just because you've had, you've been living with diabetes for 20 ish years. Do you feel like doctors off? Oh, this is from Kennedy Porter. Do you feel like doctors are often often condemn you for bad sugars or ranges? I feel like there's no encouragement, which truly makes living with it and improving that much harder. Yeah. So this is thank you for for asking me. It's a great question. Um, there is a, an Instagram page, uh, Kenna. If you feel this way, you should look up. It's called Insulin for Breakfast, like the the number four. Um, it's a new account. His name is Corey, and he essentially he was a client of ours at Risley, but he fired his endocrinologist because for years his endo was writing him like the nastiest emails, being like, "Do you really care about your diabetes? Like, why are your numbers in the three hundreds overnight?" And Corey was just like. I don't know, are you supposed to help me with this? So there's so much shame around, I think, even just showing people our, our numbers because of the fact that we've had so much judgment for so many from so many people and especially medical professionals. And there definitely needs to be work in the bedside matter category for the endocrinology field um, because the stories are are crazy. So it's it's not just you for sure. Um, and the relatability of living with type 1 diabetes makes such a big difference. Um, Anything that you want to add, Justin, to that? Um, not necessarily to that, but I do see a comment uh, that I want to, or a question yep. from Conroy88. Oh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah. What do you think of the Islet Bionic Pump that doesn't require carb counting? So, for those of you don't know, who don't know, the Islet is a brand new insulin pump that is becoming more and more available in the United States. Um, it comes from the company Beta Bionics. I spoke to the CEO on my podcast. I did a demo on my YouTube channel, and I also am interviewing Mike Natter, an endocrinologist uh, well-known in New York. He's been using the pump, uh, so he's going to come on the podcast. I'm really excited to, to ask him about it. What do I think? Um, it's a great pump for people who re really don't want to think about diabetes. Um, there are like no, the only setting you plug in is your weight, and then it asks you how small, big, how small or big your meal sizes are based off of how you normally eat. Um, I think it's impossible to be perfect with such limited settings, but for those people out there who want to be in a closed loop, but really don't want to think about their diabetes or put much work into it. It's a great option. I mean, I, it will definitely, or it should keep you above 70% most of the time. Um, but I'm eager to hear about what Mike Natter has to say. I know he has some things that he doesn't like about it and some things that he does. So that will be an interesting conversation. Have you yeah. heard anything? Yeah, I know. I spoke to somebody too from there, from uh, Beta Bionics. And I think the biggest thing is like for somebody who is, and I don't use this word, but like is categorized as like non-compliant, right? It's like A1C is 10 and like there's nothing that we can do. Is there, if a doctor is very like, like to have this option to recommend to somebody like that where like they're not getting the true support that they actually need because anybody who's not compliant is really just not getting the right support of special health wise um and helping them get through their blocks but all to say like it's going to help you drop to like an 8a1c probably it's going to help you drop to like that healthier range of 7.5 maybe it's not going to be good for somebody who's trying to get pregnant or somebody who is you know have maybe had complications and is trying to like really really get control and wants to take ownership of it but wants to outsource it to a pump. So, you know, I want, I'm i curious. I really want to listen to Mike's episode with you. So I'm I'm going to hear that. I want to listen to that. But one one other question I just want to answer um, from JP 22 Insulin resistance is the worst. Sometimes it has taken 30 units to get it down. Other times it comes down immediately almost. So I want to do a quick plug here. Justin, if you want to plug anything to you, it's like it's our live so we can do that. Um, but um, we're, I'm hosting. A, a free challenge next week starting on Monday. The link is in my personal bio, Lauren underscore Bunjor. Seven days. We're following three specific things that 
you are going to help increase time and range, lower standard deviation, and increase in sensitivity. You'll get the free guide once you just put in your email address. So the link is in my bio to join. Um, but insulin sensitivity, like, is insulin resistance is widely talked about with like type twos and pre-diabetics, but it is so key to understand for type ones. We overall want to be increasing our insulin sensitivity. So how quickly our bodies can absorb the insulin. So we don't stay higher longer. We don't go higher, you know, as high after certain meals. However, insulin resistance for some people is naturally going to happen without us being able to get ahead of it. So if you're a female and you have a menstrual cycle, like that piece, if you are anybody and you have stress, um, right, insulin resistance is your body's literal response of increase in cortisol in the body. So um, knowing how that manifests for your specific body is important. But the fact that SDJP22, you are recognizing that at some points you're highly insulin sensitive and other points you're like resistant is like the first step in in that pattern uh, and understanding how to conquer that is just knowing the pattern itself yeah um i know we're getting short on time but i think that this has been a great conversation so far it looks like a lot of people have joined we can talk about watching so um <laughs> yeah i think we'll have to do this again um and we could focus on some other stuff we did technology this time but i think a lot of what you have to say about just like um skills that people can can use um and then even like our own personal stories of what we do could be really helpful for people uh before we go um lauren why don't you tell everyone where they can find um your stuff um for the people joining from my page yeah so so everyone, you can click on my name and you can follow me. Send me a DM if you have any specific questions that maybe you want Jess and I to cover on a live or anything like that that I can help you with. Um, and you could also go to the Risely Health page and we post a lot of like community, education, upcoming things and and all of that. Um, and then Justin, what do you, I plug something. So what do you have well, to plug? Well, um, yes. So you can find me, for those joining from Lauren's page, I've got a podcast called Diabetic where I talk about all things diabetes technology. I also get into management. I, I had Lauren on the show. Um, and yeah, it's super interesting if you want to know all the technology that's coming out and just hear other people's stories. So that is available with the link in my bio. I also have a TikTok, a TikTok and an Instagram where I do like funny stuff, but also super informational stuff that you can like get in all the information in 60 seconds. Uh, and I also have a YouTube channel where my podcast goes in video form. And I've got videos dropping every Friday on there. Um, and also, of course, Lauren and I were on each other's podcast. So if you enjoyed this conversation and our banter, you should listen, listen to those episodes. You can find them with the links in um, in our bios. But um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, yes, you can send us questions. My DMs are open. I'm a little slow to respond sometimes. But like, I do my absolute best to get back to everyone. I'm not perfect. Um, there isn't always the time in the day, but, um, I do my best. So, um, yes. yeah, so, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to say next, next best step for all of you guys, keep an eye out on mine and Justin's page. We'll do this again. If you guys enjoyed this and listen to my episode on Justin's podcast, and then come over to the reclaim your rise podcast on that. I host, um, and listen to Justin's episode because it was so good. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lauren. It was great talking and have a good night guys. All Bye right. everyone. I hope you enjoyed that Q&A and got some of your questions answered. If you didn't tune in in time, that's fine. Lauren and I had a great time. I'm sure we'll do it again. And I will be sharing that on Instagram, most likely promoting it there. So keep an eye out. I've got a link to my Instagram in the description. I've also got links to both her podcast and my podcast in case you want to go listen to those. And then you can come in with more questions for us. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to subscribe to this channel if you want to see more videos like this and hit that bell for alerts if you want to get alerted as soon as my videos drop. I've got my podcast coming out every Monday on podcast platforms and on here as well as new videos every Friday. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it. It will help people find the video, which would be awesome. And uh, yeah, until next time, I'm Justin and I'll talk to you later.